So welcome to the second part, the second round of this evening, and I'm very excited to announce the panel, What Holds the World Together. And you've already met Professor Dr. Minima Akani Ahmed from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, who just gave a talk about his views on the world. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce to you Professor Dr. Armin Nassi. He is a sociologist here from the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich. And I was actually thinking we should get some of those musicians that passed by yeah, to discuss with us nice, what yeah. holds the world together because we know that mathematics, music, and maybe also sociology have some things in common. But we'll start without the music. And uh, Professor Nassi, you get the first question. What have you always wanted to ask a particle physicist? <laughs> Here, you have a chance. <laughs> well, let Be me careful first, what you ask. <laughs> let me first say two things. The, the first one is I'm a singer in two choirs, so, uh, oh. but I I'm, I'm won't, won't, won't sing here now. Uh, so this would be an, an alternative. And, and the second one, thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, it's, it could be a little bit strange to invite a sociologist to talk uh, with uh, a physicist. I've done weirder, um, for sure. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, well, maybe I'm the only one in this room who doesn't understand anything of this, uh, what Nima has said. Um, maybe there are a few physicists who also don't understand, but they yeah. cannot say that they don't understand it. Um, but... Um, it's, it's a fate of sociologists to, 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 to be on, on stages uh, in a room, the only, to be the only one who doesn't understand anything. But I, 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 I have a question to you, and I think this question is um, something that is also important for sociology. Um, it's the problem of the observer. Uh, we, we both belong to, to disciplines in which we belong to the subject we have research on. Uh, as a sociologist, I'm, I'm one who's, mm. who's uh, researching about society. Um, science itself mm. and um, sociologists are part of the society and this is a very strange thing uh, to talk about the observer because the observer doesn't look from outside on its subject but from inside to this subject. And if I understand anything of, of, of your topics, uh, you have the same problem. Uh, you have the same problem to talk about a world and you are part of this world and the observation is a, an, an insight observation of something which seems to be something that is an object which uh, has to be um, observed by outside. And uh, this is an epistemological problem um, which um, is connected to the problem of visibility and invisibility. To make a joke in the beginning, the, the, the German um, sociologist Niklas Luhmann once said that uh, in former times theologists were, were those who uh, were talking about indivisible things and now the physicists do, do. And I think that's not only a joke because theologists also um, have the problem they, that, that they talk about an Im, that they, they talk from an imminent point of view about transcendental or or exponent or how to say this uh, uh, subjects and I think that this epistemological problem has to be solved and um, I can say something about how we uh, deal with this but this would be the question how are you doing this? Boy, I could not ask for a better question. I don't know if, if this was uh, uh, intelligently designed, but uh, literally the, the part of my talk where I didn't explain um, something, uh, this, is, this is the key question which goes into uh, behind a, a lot of the most uh, uh, dramatic things in, 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 uh, in, in, what, in what I was talking about. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the kind of largest revolutionary fact about quantum mechanics is that it changed what it means to know something. Um, that, and that, that changed qualitatively from before and after. And it's true that a lot of people are still exercised about how to properly interpret quantum mechanics. I think that's mostly a, a oh, sorry, this is being recorded. So I won't say it's a subject that who's, who should be multiplied by zero in all of its importance. Uh, it has absolutely no importance or content, the interpretation of quantum mechanics um, uh, as practiced now. But there is something about it, that there is something deep that the founders of quantum mechanics very much appreciated, that, uh, uh, that quantum mechanics changes what it means to know something, uh, to be able to know something. And it's precisely because of this point that quantum mechanics forces you to divide the world, if you want to speak about anything, um, 
because of the inherently probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, uh, it forces you to divide the world into two pieces. An infinite part, an in principle infinite part, which is doing the looking, and some finite system that's being looked at. Uh, um, and uh, in practice, of course, we never get to that infinity. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but let me explain for a, for a microsecond why, uh, why we have to uh, do this. So the kind of famous thing about quantum mechanics is that we have to do the experiment over and over and over again um, because, well, we don't know what happens every single time. We can only talk about probabilities. Um, the slightly less famous is that uh, in order to get uh, a result that's, that's, uh, uh, that's reliable, our apparatus has to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, the reason is that if the apparatus has a finite size, the apparatus itself has quantum mechanical fluctuations and it can make a mistake. Uh, if, let me give an extreme example. If I'm trying to measure something, uh, any, any quantity, I'm made out of 10 to the 30 atoms. But if I try to make a measurement to an accuracy of 10 to the 10 to the 30 decimal places, which is a ludicrous number of decimal places. But if I try to make a measurement to 10 to the 10 to the 40 decimal places, by the time I get to the 10 to the 10 to the 30th decimal place, uh, my brain could have fluctuated. And instead of writing down seven, I wrote down one. Or uh, I fluctuated in a cloud of dust and I just disappeared entirely. Right. So uh, there's, a, there's a limitation um, uh, to the accuracy to, uh, that any finite system can talk about for observations because of quantum mechanics. And so quantum mechanics forces you to div make this artificial division of the world into an infinite part that's doing the looking. And, and that's how we get around this problem of, the, of uh, what is the thing which is doing the observing. There is an asymmetry that's built into it by asking for this thing to be infinitely large. Mm -hmm. And gravity hates this because gravity is universal. Gravity doesn't like this uh, strange division of the world into, into pieces. And that's why we have to do these weird things um, to go to the sort of boundaries of space-time far away in order to get access to these infinite apparatuses. And that's why when I said the biggest Pandora's box of mysteries are, is about cosmology and the fact that we have an accelerating universe. The fact that we have this universe that's accelerating means that what we see now in the universe is what we're ever going to see. We're never going to see anything more beyond that. And so it's fundamentally finite. And that finiteness is very troubling. Even though it's huge, it's still finite. And so this division of the world into infinite parts that's doing the looking and the finite part that's being looked at is meaningless. Mm -hmm. And so this, this ultimate question is not a trivial one at all and goes to the heart of the, of the most profound conceptual paradoxes in fundamental physics today. Now, speaking of being connected or disconnected, um, I mean, to be honest, we must assume that most people most people, people's brains cannot really grasp the, these concepts of space-time, even not about quantum mechanics. Are you, or are physicists like you, particle physicists, are they getting disconnected from the normal world, the normal people, or how, how do you talk to normal people? <laughs> I talk normal, I, I'm a normal person. We all, I mean, uh, uh, we, no, I, I think this is, I actually think this is a kind of, uh, um, uh, there's a, every, every epoch thinks that some aspect of its modernity is unique, and there's so much which is invariant over time. Um, probably the individual who was most disconnected from the people around them was Isaac Newton. Uh, and uh, human beings wandered around the planet for tens of thousands of years without knowing any inkling of the laws that Newton discovered about the world, and now we teach them to kids in grade 10. Okay, so, uh, so it's possible that things that it took like a, a once in a thousand year genius like Newton to figure out, we actually teach it in the high school today. So I think there isn't actually, and it's actually one of the beauties of this subject is that the ideas in the end when they're understood properly are simple and deep and they just have to be internalized. Uh, but I don't see any reason why you know, in a hundred years quantum mechanics won't be understood by kids in grade eight and Newton's laws will be understood by, you know, Anyway, that, that it'll yeah, all yeah, yeah. go Yeah, but go, Newton, go, go we down. have the yeah. apple, right? Sorry? With Newton, we have the apple. We have, like, pictures that make it simpler to, to understand. What's going to be your picture in well, 100 but, or 200 see, years? Uh, again, I, I, uh, uh, this might be a... I don't think this is a heterodox view among, among physicists. There's a, really no conceptual discontinuity between Newton and today. Um, it's just how familiar things are. 
Um, you know, when we say that we don't have intuition for quantum mechanics, we didn't, before Newton and Galileo and Kepler and those people, we didn't have intuition for throwing balls. Aristotle thought all these idiot things about what happens when you kick things and how they move around. That was the intuition of Aristotle, and it was massively wrong. It took some kind of idealized situations, thinking about things without friction and this and that, to start, start seeing the situations where you can build a new intuition for something. And that's the idea, is to figure out the kind of proper entry into a, into a subject where you sweep away in the beginning when you're learning it all the sort of irrelevant, complicating details to train your intuition on sort of simple enough examples that you can start building a sort of pump on your own to learn things in a, clean and, in a clean and cleaner and cleaner way. When physicists practice quantum mechanics daily, it's not because we grew up you know, having a, this uh, intuition about the quantum world, but we could learn it. We could learn it uh, in a systematic way. I don't see any reason that'll so change. So you can learn time. to think in 10 dimensions. Well, that's, a, uh, that's an especial triviality compared to all the other things, because it's just, uh, uh, it's really especially trivial compared to, I mean, it's not that different from uh, 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 learning to think in three dimensions. Actually, I can't think in three dimensions, never mind 10. I find it very difficult to visualize things in uh, three dimensions. Maybe some of my colleagues are crazy visualizers, but I, I can barely do it. But I use the power of uh, coordinates, x1, x2, x3. And then once you do that in three dimensions, then you know, tacking on six more to get to 10 dimensions. Is, oh, sorry. I can't really add, I guess, seven more to get to 10 he's, dimensions. He's just yes, trying right, to think right. in yeah, 10 anyway, dimensions. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I see. What do you think? Is there some some way? She thinks I'm full of crap. Well, she thinks that <laughs> 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 she's very skeptical. But, uh, yeah. Well, interesting is the question: Is there um, a dimension of this or that? And the question is how to think these things. And I think for sociology, it's it's, it's enough to have three dimensions, and that's uh, that's uh, something we have we have to think about is that uh, the question of a of a of a, of a grand theory which is in which 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 can um, ask questions uh, about questions about theorizing theories is a selection principle in in, in science yes uh, we we normal science is a science which is able to 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 answer to to very limited questions that means uh, in in sociology for example the the, the, the interconnectedness of, 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 of uh, social inequality and, and education or something like that. That's very easy to, 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 to measure, that's very easy to talk about, that's very easy to, uh, to, to bring this into dimensions which can be also um, um, explained to people who are not sociologists. That's, that's very easy. But also in sociology we, had, we have, we have the, the chance to, to think about what is the theory of theorizing for example, a society. A society is not uh, a community of people. A society is nothing you can observe. A society is, first of all, a notion. And this notion means that we, we have to talk about an entity which is not visible. It's not visible that there are relationships between people who are in this room. The relationships can be observed by it the things people do in this room. And this is another dimension uh, than the self-description of what we are thinking about this group which is in this room or in the online sphere uh, looking at us. And that that's seems see, seem to be for the no normal sociologists uh, very strange questions, but they have these questions have uh, well, consequences for the idea to talk about um, research questions which arise from such questions which uh, deal with invisible, in first instance, invisible um, uh, particles. <laughs> I use this word particles. You have said I, I, I'm about the real and virtual particles. The virtual part particle is, if I understand it uh, correctly, uh, a, a, a kind of hypothesis about uh, what could be seen if it would be possible to see this invisible things and not, not bad. Yeah. yes and and, and then that, that's that's a parallel to to sociology because we have to have a theory about society and this theory is pre-empirical to develop empirical questions about what we can see and what we cannot see is this understandable for you if not it's not a problem because I didn't understand what he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I see very many parallels between physics and sociology here, right? Yeah. But, but you know, if you... Well, we are on the same stage, yeah, there so must we, be parallels. Yeah. <laughs> 
But if you, if you both communicate, if you try to explain, let's say, Rima, you're talking to, you know, you're going to a physics fair and talking to people who just, you know, walk by and, and uh, what's, what's, how, how do you, which narratives do you use? Which images do you use? How would you explain this? Because you don't have, it, you know, the chance of doing these, these new Feynman diagrams that you did there. Oh, yeah, no, I would not talk about this crap. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, um, uh, I, no, I mean, uh, seriously, I think, uh, and I actually do this a lot. I, 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 one of my favorite things is hanging out with high school physics teachers. Um, and uh, um, sometimes they come with their high school students, sometimes they just come themselves. And in the beginning, when I started doing this 15 years ago, I gave some talks like this, and I was all very polite and fine, and then I gradually realized what they really wanted to do was sit around and talk for three or four or five hours about cool physics problems, about the world we see outside, out there. And uh, that you can really do, and, and, uh, and I think uh, from what you learn in, in physics, I don't know, in grade 10, 11, uh, even by that point, you can understand kind of half of what you see in the world around you um, from first, first principles. And it takes some patience and some time to do it, and you have to start practicing, but it's really possible to do. And um, if I had to uh, spend my life as a sort of physics communicator, I would emphatically not talk about the latest, greatest stuff that's going on with all this fancy schmancy stuff which is kind of crazy uh, to do that. You know, we've built over centuries this spectacular mansion, which is our picture of the physical world. Um, and uh, writing books about the latest craze is like taking someone through this mansion and running through every, every incredible room and not pausing for a second and getting up to the one room that's under construction. It makes zero sense, okay? Um, this, uh, uh, and in fact, it, makes, uh, and it, and it, it does the entire subject a great disservice because knowing the things that are true about the world already is so spectacular, so counterintuitive in some ways, but so appreciative, uh, uh, so able to be appreciated, often without lots of technical details. Um, uh, and uh, if I had one wish, it's that more people in the world, uh, one wish about this subject, I mean, there are many other wishes, love, war, et cetera, <laughs> but, uh, but about this subject, it's that, um, uh, it's that uh, as many people as possible knew something true about the world that was surprising. Um, I think uh, the, the fact that there are many, many true things about the world that are, that are surprising, that are not obvious, but what humans can discover and that you can know for yourself and check for yourself is incredibly important, is very empowering, and it gets in your mind the idea that there are things that are true uh, that are not easy to find out that are true, but that once you know them, no one can take them away from you. And I think our world needs that more today than it has in centuries. So explaining what holds the world together. Yeah, well, and, and, and explaining at the very, very most basic level. Why do you see a rainbow where you see it in the sky? You know, why, why is grass green? Why is water wet? That, that, that kind of question. Um, really, uh, uh, it's funny. Uh, uh, when I have these conversations with the teachers and the students, I ask them, I say, ask me any question about the world. Go, any question at all. And believe it or not, people will begin with, what about black holes? What about cosmology? I'm like, are you kidding? That's your first question about the world you want to know? <laughs> like, there's like five million other questions about the world. So it takes them some time to like figure out that I really mean, why is grass green? Why is water wet? Why do you see a rainbow in the sky? How long does it take the surface of a water, of a pond to freeze in the winter? And all these things you can figure out by yourself from things uh, that incredible people like Newton and Galileo and Kepler gave us from 400 years ago, but which anyone can do with a very tiny amount of work. But maybe that's what people like. There's this fascination about, you know, what's, what we don't understand, right? Yeah. The black maybe, holes and so on. Maybe, maybe the physicist has, a, it's, it's easier for you to, to make a, a, a narrative about um, your topics. The problem of my topic is that everyone in the world has a <laughs> has private a theory, theory yeah, right, yeah. of uh, what's going I on do. in society. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, right. And, and, and of course, there, there, there are theories of societies inside of society. If you talk to a business, to business people, or to politicians, or to um, physicians, they all have theories of society. That means that they that they theorize. Um, they have own narratives about this topic. And the sociologist, first of all, has to say, 
all these uh, self-descriptions are only self-description of a system which um, uses these self-descriptions to, 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 to give itself um, a more easy or, or, or more simple uh, form of, of operating. If you look at the, me the, 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 the mechanisms and the, the processes, for example, in an organization like a university, that's not very complicated, uh, you can see that this organization, uh, university, works with a lot of invisibilities. We, we think that we are the university, but the university can only be run by things which are simultaneously in this space. It's a problem of space, uh, of invisible space, because this university has um, preconditions which cannot be controlled by them, by, by those people who describe the university as an organization in which Uh, we make uh, science or um, teaching or something like that. And these self-descriptions and theories of these self-descriptions are not uh, the same. And that's the problem of the sociologist because he, 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 he sees people, he meets people who all have a kind of an, uh, an everyday sociological theory of their own lives. And uh, that's very, very complicated to, to, to confront them with their narratives which use other methods which use other, other notions or which use notions which seem to be like the same um, used in everyday life, but they aren't. When I'm talking about society, I don't mean the same as people say the society has, uh, well, it must be hold together. But what does this mean? That, that, that's, um, and I'm talking not about, not about the world. Yes, that's an, another, another topic about the society. I think society is, an, is, an, is a topic which is uh, characterized not by something that, that holds it together, but how to organize things which are simultaneously working. And because they are simultaneously working, it's not easy to, uh, to describe it as a unity because the simultaneity um, um, corrupts the idea of causality of things which are uh, in the same time. Yes, it's a problem of space-time. <laughs> and, and, so, and so we have, we have to see that the notion of society in sociology is not the same as the notion mm. of, soci of, of society in society. Yeah. And, and so we are at our first problem that the observer um, changes its topic by observing this topic. And that's very interesting. It seems to be like a sentence of a physicist. Mm. But from what you just said about this simultaneously, or simultaneous problems and things changing, it almost sounds like you need physics. You need more physics in sociology maybe to, to explain Sociological mechanisms. Not physics, but 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 this. Physicists. Right, this, this, that's, <laughs> physicists. <laughs> that's right. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> right. But this this radical attitude. Sounds right to me. Yeah. Right. I that, think this uh, radical yeah. attitude to yeah. to not 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 to believe in the first uh, first glance. That's that's yeah. very that's very important. That's what 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 you've said. If if science has a meaning in society, it means uh, not to take for granted what everyone takes for granted. I think this is the first attitude of, of science and mm -hmm. scientists uh, in all disciplines uh, in our university and all universities of the world. And I think that's the point where we should have more self-confidence to say this is a question no one can um, can uh, answer questions like us. And I think this is a, a point which has a meaning of its own. Uh, so we... we, we, we shouldn't justify why do we deal with problems like this. You said it in your, in your talk at the end. Why, why, why should we do that? Um, we don't know what is the outcome of most of research. And because we don't know, that means that we are living in an open world, which is not causally determined, but there is an openness that means that, that, uh, that um, well, path dependencies uh, are only visible in processes and not in a structure which is um, stable over time. I think at an even simpler level, it's, it's so cliche now to talk about follow the science, listen to scientists, blah, 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 without actually understanding at the most basic level what that means. And uh, the, maybe the most important thing um, uh, in the sort of intellectual behavior of the scientists is to always remember that we do not traffic in certainties. Nothing is certain at any moment in time, and that's just life. Uh, that's just the way it is. Um, we have degrees of confidence, though, and not being certain doesn't mean that you ha can be lazy, that, you, that uh, um, 
Uh, but uh, you have to know that you have to keep an open mind, but as Robert Oppenheimer famously said, not so open that your brains fall out. So you're always in this interesting, delicate balancing act to, to traffic in degrees of confidence. And, uh, and the other thing, I think this touches on the point that you made, physicists uh, have learned this lesson over and over again, and we still kept, keep having to relearn it. It's a very uh, easy trap to fall into, not to reify, give, give, uh, um, uh, give reality significance to the tools we use to describe reality. Um, uh, very often people ask me, don't you care about what the ultimate structure of reality is? And I say, I do care about it, but I respect this question so much that I don't want to spend my time on useless philosophizing about it. Um, I want to get closer to the answer, and I know that I'm not going to get anywhere near the answer in my lifetime, but it's a much better use of the finite time that I do have to, to try to get some concrete knowledge about it with entirely appreciating that all I'm talking about is describing this ridiculously magical structure out there uh, and nothing necessarily into how real it is because uh, what our notion of what reality is just keeps changing over and over again. There's no reason to think that uh, we're, we're anywhere near the end of that journey now. But doesn't that mean, I mean, I hear this skepticism that you that you um, bring with you know your research to and and also when you say people say follow the science and they don't even know what it means but th does that mean you need to as scientists talk more about what science really is what that process means what the uncertainties are that nothing is you know fixed forever that you always yeah. Put everything yeah. into question. Well, na na naive expectations towards science is that science could uh, give you clear, unique, and um, well, everlasting truths, and that's not true. Yeah, that's uh, in, in, during the pandemic we have we have seen that that the expectations were very strong uh, towards science, and and people who are not connected with science uh, had to learn that uh, science has to learn. To learn means to change uh, the ideas. Uh, during the research, what 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 is a virus like the 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 coronavirus? Um, we expect well, we means the society expects that um, there are virologists and they have to say what is this virus and what can we do against it. And then they had to learn that uh, the process of research itself is a learning process. That means that hypothesis um, must be negated, must be um, formulated newly, and all these things are, um, are uh, hints at the social, um, or, or um, otherwise, I think that science itself as a, as a topic of sociology means science is something that happens in society, and in society you, you, you only have processes in which uh, people communicate with one another, and when they do that, they come to sentences they believe in or they don't. So, they, so, so you can see in science, inside of science, sentences which are contradictory, and they are both science, and the... the, the um, uh, the expectation to science is that every contradiction must be negated. And I think that's very interesting. I think p a lot, lots of people have learned something about science, but also they are very um, in trouble with science because the expectation and what they get uh, is not the same. I think that there's a very important point here. I mean, it, it's, not a, it's not even a nuanced point. It's a really crucial point. It's a distinction, at least I believe, I think most of us in physics, most of... Uh, uh, most of the sciences, I think, believe, although it's not universally uh, shared um, uh, in some discussions with colleagues a little further afield, I certainly believe that there's out there a complete truth with a capital T. It exists and it's out there. Um, I also believe that at any given moment, our appreciation of what it is is approximate. And so we can't, even if we have some spectacular understanding of something, we should be open to the idea that it's some sort of locally perfect thing uh, but that there will be other bigger, larger animals that we'll discover later that will reconceptualize what we thought we had understood perfectly before from a different uh, point of view. Um, so uh, it's, uh, so I, I don't think there's any relativism. I don't think there's uh, different ways of knowing. I don't think uh, this might be, uh, it might be a controversial point of view in some circles, but I will go to the grave believing that there is a truth with the capital T out there and that as, as scientists what we're doing is trying to 
expose it more and more. But as scientists, we're highly imperfect people. We suck at this mostly, okay? And what, uh, what gets us going, what gives us any prayer of progress is how magnificent the thing is that we're actually studying. Uh, it's interacting with this thing that makes us better constantly uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, removes our, our imperfections as we start uh, revealing but what it isn't, is. Isn't science itself, or maybe science plus the system that you know fuels it, the funding, and so on? Doesn't science itself raises expectations that it cannot live up to? I mean, like you know, people saying, "Oh, I've made this discovery, and it's going to save you know millions of life," or "I found a, a new way of uh, building a quantum computer," or whatever. I mean, there's lots of promises out there, yeah. right? Well, let, let, let me give you some sociological sentences. Um, there are expectations to the political system that means to steer the society, to, to give society a shape. The only function of political system is to, to make uh, collectively binding s um, decisions. That's a difference. And we see that, 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 that the public, that a, the societal public has other expectations to the political system then political system can solve. Um, the same is true for the economic system. We expect from the economic system, um, well, things and, uh, and uh, uh, products which uh, are good for this society. The only thing we get is, uh, well, something you can earn money with. That's a difference. That are two different things. And the same is true for Science. We expect from science unique sentences and security, and what we get are sentences which are contradictory to each other and to one another. And that's a problem, I think, that cannot be solved. The sociologist can say, um, please do not um, um, repeat these expectations, but uh, talk about the problem, how to, uh, how to deal with these... Um, well, contradictory, this, this contradiction between expectation and the function in society. And I think that the pandemic and other crises are so, um, so hard to, to, to live in because these expectations become visible in these uh, in this, uh, stages of societal uh, development in normal times, whatever that is. In normal times, you don't see this contradictory thing. But doesn't science also fuel itself with... The, these expectations, would science get as much money it does, or research, if it would always say, oh, we don't really know, and no, the, no, no. the future is uncertain, and so on? Well, he, he, he talked two minutes ago, or three minutes ago, like a theologist. He said, there is one truth outside, but the mm -hmm. scientist is not able to to, to, to achieve it, to, to, to get to this. And this, this, this is very interesting because, because he That's doesn't... That's how it feels. He doesn't I mean, it absolutely is. I mean, it's, a, it's an explicit replacement for God. I'm, I'm an atheist yeah. as atheistic as And that's be. not a crit but criticism, that, no, no, I right. think. But it that's, absolutely is. Yeah, that's and, an, and I wish more people had yeah. it because I think it's crucial for people in the world to yeah. realize that there are things that transcend our yeah. crappy little pathetic lives. Yes. And that's and an interesting... some giant thing out there interesting. and it really is out there. And it's out there. Um, so... Uh, They're here in yeah, our university. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> I think that's a very interesting epistemological problem because, because if we think about a difference between this truth which is there outside and the capabilities we have with our theories and methods and all like this, that's, that's, that's a very, very um, good narrative about, about science. And um, then when, when I'm asked about the, the question why should we fund these strange things you are working with, uh, then I say here to the business people, they say there is no benefit without risk. You cannot, you cannot uh, produce any benefit when you can also, uh, well, do wrong things. It's not, not, you are not able to do things when you know what will be the result of what you are doing, but if, if you know, you don't, you don't need any research. But, uh, and I think that there, there are parallels um, of, of narratives mm -hmm. which, which are working better than the justification to say, okay, you, you also need us because, because we, are, we are just there. <laughs> but I mean, I would just, just to say that, that, that there are some things that are sort of nuanced and delicate and some things that are super simple and straightforward. If you're a scientist, your job is to A, don't do crappy science. Okay, so all this sort of pandemic, blah, blah, blah problems, I mean, zeroth order problem is just 
sometimes quite crappy science is being done. There are, there are models that are literally curve fits with zero, I mean like zero uh, uh, mechanism going into what's happening that were early on being used to predict the, 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 the sort of future oh, yeah. course of the pandemic. Completely ludicrous, right? Um, uh, that's just crappy science. So don't do crappy science. And be honest. That's it. I mean, there's not too many things we have to do. That, uh, don't, don't like, exaggerate, don't lie, be honest. Um, if you make a mistake, be honest and own up. We all make mistakes, be honest and uh, own up to it. Um, I, I actually think, I, again, my attitude about this is perhaps a little heterodox. Um, uh, even people in science are so concerned with what does it take to keep our funding up and blah. And, you know, science progresses in bizarre fits and starts and is driven by lots of eccentric, fascinating individual characters and not often by these large collective efforts with huge amounts of funding, blah, blah, blah. So I'm personally not that worried about science. I think science is going to be fine. Uh, so long as there are human beings around who are uh, allowed to live in free societies and, and uh, do something beyond subsistence for their livelihood, People will do it, whether or not we have large organizations and support them with large grants. And we can go back and forth about how much that's actually a good or a bad thing. I mean, I'm, I'm of two minds about it myself. I'm not that worried about the future of humanity, the future of science, so long as the basic setup that we've managed to hold since the Enlightenment in, in, in the West um, continues uh, the way it is. That, that there are some people who can do an honest day's work and, uh, and do something beyond pure sub subsistence. But do you think even, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I just read the story, the triumph and tragedy of the Higgs boson. You know, it's a triumph and tragedy because we know lots of, you know, big accelerator. Right. Up to now, we only see right. this one Higgs boson that came out and maybe nothing else. Do you think people will, in 10 or 20 years, decide they will spend another 50 billion don't know. I don't know. Uh, don't know. And, uh, and I think, um, I, I have to say, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, over the past uh, five years, uh, you know, trying to make the case that we should build the next accelerator after large hadron. It's not an obvious case. I don't believe it's axiomatic that we should keep doing it just because we've done it in the past. You know, I don't think, I think everything should be on the table. Um, I personally think we should do it because I think the intellectual case for doing it is very, very strong. Um, but uh, I think it's open for discussion, and, and, uh, and uh, we should just say what we'll actually learn from, uh, from doing it. And the, the, the narrative that goes along with what we'll actually learn is very different than the narrative that people were talking about 20 or 30 years ago, given what we've learned. Um, and then we just have to make the case to the world. Uh, well, one of the funny things that you'll find among uh, uh, particle physicists, this is very special to this part of physics, Precisely because making the case for continuing the experimental side of the subject anyway does require going with your hat in your hand and asking for five or 10 or 20 or 30 billion in your favorite units. Um, uh, uh, then sometimes you'll hear a physicist say, oh, but it's too bad, we've only discovered the Higgs particle, nothing, it will never convince the politicians now to build the next collider. And, and I think this is the most hysterical thing, as if the sort of politicians are sitting there saying, oh gosh, they only discovered the Higgs particle with a mass of 125 GeV. That's a, uh, they don't know what the hell the, what they're even talking about. They don't know what any of this means, right? You know, so it's the job of the scientists to explain why uh, the, what we've discovered is exciting, um, why it's strange, why it's mysterious, why it's very important to put this new particle, we've never seen anything like it before, under a microscope and study it to death. And um, what I find is most often the physicists who make this case about not being able to convince politicians and so on, it's not really the politicians. They can't convince themselves that they had some sort of internal narrative for how they wanted the subject to go, and it changed under their feet. And they're, they're you know, 50 years old now, and they don't feel like going all the way back to square one. And so they're, they're in a it, weird internal state of conflict. And so they like to blame the politicians. I think it's ridiculous to blame the politicians. We can blame the politicians for a lot of things, but insufficiently nuanced understanding of the details of the latest discovery of particle physics is not one of them. Uh, and, um, and so I think, uh, um, uh, again, it's the job of the scientists to be honest, to be honest, say why we care. Um, and I said at the end of my talk, I mean, uh, you know, that there's a kind of a big picture reason why we should keep doing basic science. Um, the biggest picture reason is what I said, is I think uh, if we don't keep doing basic science, in the end we'll be trapped by the limitations of what human ingenuity is capable of. And human ingenuity is awesome. It's absolutely awesome, and especially in modern times, we are very enamored of it, more and more for very good reasons. But it's finite. 
it's absolutely finite. And if we, are, if we don't have access to something more powerful and more magical and bigger and deeper, then we'll, we'll eventually run out. The only thing that's more powerful and bigger and deeper that we know is that thing out there. And so that's why it's worth people continuing to study it, because that, that's the only place something grand and great is going to come. There's a more practical reason, I would say. Uh, the world has all kinds of long-term problems um, that we have to learn how to solve. That It's not obvious how to go about solving them. It, it might take decades to solve. And it's very important, I think, to have a group of people whose professional job it is to work on problems where it's not remotely clear how to make progress. It's not like there's some established program that you keep going on. You know, you're working on problems that's even difficult to define. You know it's going to take decades or centuries to solve. And it's important to have a group of people out there who do it, because it's a template for how you go about doing this. And I can tell you, I've heard this from titans of industry. I've heard it from you know, uh, the bosses at Google and Microsoft and other places. I've heard it from their mouths that, uh, that they believe that this fact that you learn by osmosis how to go about solving very long-term, very hard problems by being around people who do them is absolutely crucial, even for the things that they did, which of course transformed the world in many ways, but I would also say in a perhaps uh, scientifically egotistical way are not at the same you know, level of, of uh, depth and, uh, and uh, difficulty as some of the things that, that, that are being done in, uh, in uh, science. So, and it's not me saying that, it's them saying that. Yeah. So I think that's a more practical reason why it's worth doing. I'm practical on the 10 or 20 year time scale reason for doing this kind of thing too. I would like to come back to our central question, Amina, see what holds the world together? And I mean, we, we've heard a lot of what holds the world together from a physicist. I understood you in one of your half sentences that you don't really like the question when it comes to sociology. Uh, I mean, people have the feeling, and there's lots of headlines, we're talking about society eroding, you know, people getting more and more individualistic, uh, particular interests. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so what, what holds the society together? I like the question, but I don't like most of the answers. Most of the answers also in sociology are contaminated by the, the mm -hmm. answers society gives itself. And that's a problem. In my, in my discipline, in sociology, you often find political perspectives on society. That's not, 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 not this question about what can we see when we talk about society. It's, it's a self-description of society with longer sentences than those um, um, can, can, can formulate who are on the street. But, but it's, it's, it's nothing really um, basically different to this. I think that uh, what, what, what society is, uh, or society is held together by the ability to, to bring together things which have to solve different problems in the same time. This society, this modern functional differentiated society, I, I use system theoretical, um, theoretical uh, theories, uh, models for this, this society is held together by the ability that in the same time, different forms of problem solving are working, and because these are different forms of problem solving, they cannot be put together to one great unique um, entity. This, this idea of society means um, it is the, the, the simultaneity of different things. And I think from, from the point of view of a systems theorist, it's very interesting that the only a basic particle, to say it in, in your words, of society is not that what holds society together, but it's the, the, the operation of the concrete events, and that's communication and action. That's very interesting that most of the communications and actions in this society are not directly related to, it, to, to one another. It's... It's, it's, in the contrary, uh, a system which has a high complexity, which has a, um, a simultaneity of dependency and the interruption of dependencies, and it's a system that unity is, all, all, is, is only a unity of description and not of operations. I think that's a very, a very um, abstract 
um, uh, um, uh, description of society. I think it's theoretically the only fitting description because we can see empirically that the, the, the capability of this society is directly connected to the ability that different things can happen in the same time. I, I'm repeating this, uh, this sentence, yes? And that holds this society together. And because of this, it is very complex. And because of this, it cannot be steered from one, one point of view. And because of this, it is able to make um, open processes um, possible. For example, the open process you said in science, that science only has to solve scientific problems. That, that seems to be something that, 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 that says, well, we are only solving our problems, your problems are not ours. That's right. Science can only work when science only solves scientific problems. Although, although there are other areas in society, for example, arts or music or religion. Religion only has to solve religious problems in this society. In former societies, religion and society was nearly the same, and these differentiation processes are able to, um, to, to, to let arise capabilities um, which are only possible because these different processes only have to solve their own problems. We are talking about things which are for most of the people completely unimportant and completely ununderstandable, but it's the precondition to talk, for example, uh, we, that, that we can talk together about problems which arise in our communication. They don't exist in society itself. That's very interesting and that holds the society together. And that's the point because no one is really happy and lucky in this modern society. And that, that's a solution, not a problem. I just want to interject one point though, that, that uh, it's just a, it's a small point. But the, the definition of what science is itself is not a static thing and changes as we discover more things about science. So I think it's really the most open-minded thing from that point of view that at least I know of. Uh, it happened in the most dramatic way in physics and that what, what the Newtonian people thought physics was about changed in the year 1925, 6, 7, just completely changed. So that the, the, the notion of what science even means is something what, which evolves as we learn more, more about science. I s believe you two should get together. I mean, you're talking about complex systems. Physics is complex systems all <laughs> over. I mean, and, uh, you should get together and do a um, common research project. I have a proposal. Uh, what okay. is it? Uh, yeah, what well, is it? Uh, well, uh, you know, there's all kinds of um, uh, studies and things I've seen with like sociologists studying mm -hmm. Uh, physicists and scientists. I'd like physicists to study sociologists, um, uh, and actually, but but maybe more more directly, uh, and and not not kidding. I think it would be interesting to swap jobs for a month. <laughs> okay, great. I mean, like not 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 a year, not, but but not 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 also a day. I actually think it would be great in society in general. Like I would love to swap job with those flight. At, the people behind the airline counters typing your boarding pass. What are they doing for five minutes? Typing, typing, right? You know? So I think if we swap jobs for a day, maybe we could figure out how to do it better. I'm not saying we'd figure out how to do sociology better, but I think we, we might be able to, I think it would be great for the world to have people swap jobs for a day. But I think this is interesting enough, we should swap jobs for a month. And uh, you know, you walk into my office and see what it's like with these weird people walking in and talking to you. Great and I would offer. Go to your I would, office. And, I would do and, it. Uh, I would and just do see it. what it's like. And then we'd write some essay about it afterwards. Words. This yeah. sucked, or <laughs> or this was great, you know. So I, I don't know. I don't know how it feel uh, ahead of time. I'm way. sure that but it would, think, would uh, be easier uh, for you uh, than for me uh, to change. But but I, th I think that there, there would be one topic, and it, it's a topic I I, I, I uh, was talking about at the beginning of our of our um, uh, talking here. I think the problem of the observer. That's that, that that's the, the main for for me. It's the main problem. Uh, to, to think about the observer from the point of view that the observer changes the topic mm -hmm. when it observes this topic. And I think that's something I, I could learn from, from, from a physicist and 
probably you could learn this from the practice of sociology. That, that, that's, that's the point we have, we have as our everyday problem in our research. We go to, for example, I'm, I'm searching about uh, palliative care. I said it in, 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 in hospitals. And when we talk to, to, to the people there, the physicians and, and mm -hmm. the nurses and, and all these people, we change the topic by asking them can you, can you give, because, give an example because, like what 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 well, what's, well, what, we, what's we, an we, we ask them about the difference of their problem solving uh, uh, routines and this question lets arise in their brains that they have different problem solving solving routines so we the, the, the question determines the answer and the answer is something that sh that, that that has not to exist before the question uh, was made, and that's that's very interesting. It's it's a it's a it's a feedback loop. I think that's a, that is something. Can you which try? Is easy. Have you? I mean, I presume. Can you? What, what if what if you go in without a question, but just ask them to roughly talk about subject X? Is that not useful? What, yes, that, that is that is useful. That is, that is, that is, this is one of of the methods in in qualitative research, and um, alone this question, not to have a question to let them communicate to let them talk changes their view of themselves. Yes, and this is a, a feedback loop of research in the topic itself. And I think that is something, if, if, I, if I understood a little bit of your talk, uh, you, you were talking about things about nurses in black holes and something like that. Great. We have about 100 witnesses in this room that you two... We have two uh, projects, yeah, so that's great. Sort yeah. of willing to work together and to maybe swap jobs. So we'll, let, we'll leave it there. And We'd have to do it by Zoom, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to visit him in Prince. So. Okay, very okay. good. <laughs> and have lunch with you in Munich. So anyway, the floor is open for questions and more suggestions about common research projects between a physicist and a sociologist. So who wants to take the mic first? Oh, I, we have a question here. Yes. Hello, I, I have a question to Professor Nassi. Um, I th thought I understood that you were a little bit against interdisciplinarity, or not really? Against I mean, interdisciplinarity? I mean, no, when you no. said that uh, like there's all these layers in society and they should all stick to... Ah, okay, okay. No, no. I, I, I was talking about science. The logic of science is another logic than the logic of, for example, politics or, um, or economics. Inside of science... Uh, there are, we have, we have shown you, um, scientific questions which unify science as a, well, as something that tries to say something about the existing world. And that, that is something uh, that holds science together. And there are differences. I myself, I'm working uh, with, with other disciplines, for example, with, with brain researchers, with theologists. I love theologists because they are able to think in paradoxical figures. Uh, I'm, I'm working with, with uh, physicians because my topic is in, in hospitals. No, I'm not against interdisciplinarity. I'm against the idea that the whole society is a is one unique entity which can be described by one principle. Um, only the principle that this principle means that there are differences which cannot be overturned. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'm against interdisciplinarity. <laughs> but that I, but, was, I, but, that, but that I really was like, but no, but no, but I like his uh, way. I mean, I, I pr prefer to call this cross disciplinary, but anyway, uh, I, I think it's really great for the world to have curious, open-minded experts. People who specialize in things but are open-minded and want to learn about other things. But I think people who are professional interdisciplinarians have the problem that they suck at everything. Uh, and uh, so it's important to actually know something and be really, really good at at least one thing. Uh, anyway, that's also a hetero heterodox view. This is not being recorded. Oh, it is being recorded. Oh, sorry. I love interdisciplinarity deans. It's great. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. The sorry. world is sorry still on that. here. Yeah. 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 Sorry, still. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We'll take more questions. 
Yes, here's one. Uh, uh, I'm not a scientist, and I couldn't, unfortunately, could not understand everything. What, what is it? But uh, I was, uh, for me, it was very interesting to see that uh, uh, some words that you use in your explanation, they are, of course, used in the art context as well. Yeah. So my first question would be: Do you have any aesthetic motivation behind your research? And the second question is the following: I was thinking also about painting. Yeah, and one thing, for example, modern painters, yeah, Cezanne, a French painter, he completely shifts the, the the idea of perspective, yeah, trying to form maybe a new uh, grammar, a new syntax, on, uh, uh, and trying certainly to grasp uh, the real, yeah, uh, that is so intangible and so difficult to grasp. And would you say that this is also something that you try? Uh, as a scientist, like trying to find a new grammar or a new perspective or a new point of view that completely gives another reality for this Rio? Is this a question for me? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, um, well, um, well, first of all, of course, there is a very, very strong aesthetic sense in what uh, people do, in, in, certainly in, uh, in mathematics and physics. But, uh, but um, it's a very particular kind of aesthetic sense. It's not um, and I think it has strong overlap with a certain kind of art or a certain way of doing art, but like not like random kinds of, uh, you know, modern, I don't know, whatever. I, I, I'm not a fan of mod modern art, but I'm a huge fan of Renaissance paintings and the Pre-Raphaelites and, uh, and um, uh, uh, the, the, the notion of, of beauty and aesthetics that we have in, in mathematics and physics is a very austere one. Uh, and it's uh, essentially about rigidity. It's that the things that we're studying have a sense of inevitability about them. Once you understand things properly, one thing follows after the other uh, with doing essentially nothing yourself. The, again, it's the grandeur of the thing that's being studied and not the inventiveness or the ingenuity or the cleverness of the practitioner. And there are things in art that are like that. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, Beethoven famously uh, struggled mightily and, uh, to, uh, and corrected things over and over and over and over again until he got something like the Fifth Symphony that sounds like perfectly one note follows after the other with complete logical inevitability. You should look on YouTube. Uh, I've talked about this subject many times before, but it was just astonishing. Leonard Bernstein gave a spectacular, uh, um, had an incredible series of uh, TV programs in the 1950s. And the very first one was called, uh, I think it was called Omnibus. And it was exactly about Beethoven. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and exactly about the mighty struggle that Beethoven went through in order to produce this thing that starts with da 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 da, and then everything is just like could not be done any differently, one note after the other. And he did it by finding all kinds of uh, passages that Beethoven had put in and thrown and, and, and discarded, and he put them back in. He had a sort of live symphony orchestra there, so he put them back in. Uh, and saw what it did to the piece, and they were terrible. They were all just terrible, not just because we're used to the right way of doing it, but because objectively they were terrible. But it didn't just come out like that. In one gush, it was eight years of massive struggle to, uh, to make it work. Um, uh, so this idea that there's some perfect thing out there that you're revealing, and you suck, but you get in the neighborhood of this thing, and gradually, 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 it reveals itself. That's a very powerful sense. That's a sense of aesthetic at least that I have, that I think most of us in, in this subject have. It's about rigidity. It's about it not able to be any other way once you get in the base of attraction of what it is. And there are things like that in music. There are things like there are some novelists that are like that, you know. Uh, um, uh, but not, not all of art, but there is a significant part of art that has a, has a similar uh, uh, aesthetic sense. And your, the second part of your question is, do we feel like we're looking for radical changes of perspective? Of course, we're open to the idea that there are radical changes of perspective. There is a difference, though, which is that we are constrained by actually describing the world. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a funny thing that, that the, the, the temperament of a, of a scientist and whether their temperament is suited to their time is a very difficult question, which is, I think, a less, uh, less of an issue in, in the art, in the arts. If you have a strong enough, you know, artistic personality and you have some temperament to do something, you can just go out and do it. And you can start your own style and your own thing. And, okay, maybe no one's paying attention, but you can just do it. 
Whereas, you know, you might be temperamentally a conservative, you might be temperamentally a radical or revolutionary, but you're, the, the time in the development of subject could be just a time for conservative development. That's what it is 95% of the time. It might be a time that needs a particular kind of revolutionary thinking that's not the kind that you're good at. Um, and so you have to do whatever you can. You know, it's not about you, you it's about it. <laughs> and so you do whatever you can with whatever limited uh, talents you have. And so that's a, more, that's a more difficult thing. So it's not up to us. So we might desperately think it would be so cool to have a different change of perspective. And if, if it was anywhere between the year 1930 and 1980, you know, that would have been a very bad time to have that point of view because that was a period in physics where it was really important to just take the laws that were handed and just study them to death and work out their consequences. And you didn't need to be a revolutionary or radical at all. The irony is that a lot of the, the heroes from that uh, period were young people who were doing the conservative thing, and their older people who had lived through one revolution after the other kept trying to do revolutionary thing, and it was just irrelevant afterwards. Okay? So you just never know uh, ahead of time. And that's an extra sort of burden that we have in science, that, uh, that our, that our uh, aesthetic temperament may or may not be suited to the times that we're living in. May I, may I say something very, very briefly? Um, I love aesthetically satisfying theories. Let me give you two examples. One is um, Kant's critique of pure reason, which has a strange loop. It is, in first instance, aesthetically plausible because you think about the preconditions of thinking and you have to think them so you are able to think. And the second one is systems theory, to say this very basic sentence that a system is more inert than its environment. And the environment only exists from the point of view or the perspective of the system. That's very, uh, that it has an, an elegance, and this elegance is the, is the, the precondition to develop very interesting questions, uh, even in sociology, maybe also in physics. Okay, I think we'll kind of phase out on this art question and art consideration. And thank you so much for this uh, interesting and entertaining dialogue here on the on the panel and uh, I think you can go home with a lot of uh, food for thought and uh, we're looking forward to your cooperation <laughs> sir we want a joint joint paper but, uh, <laughs> right at least one joint paper and I hand over the micro to no I <laughs> <laughs> I thought the... Get up here, Johannes. You've got to say some speech, speech, <laughs> Last speech. Last words. Speech, speech. Come on, come on. Get up here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, thank you. I think this is just wonderful. I, I, I don't know what to add. Um, I just hope uh, everyone had uh, just as good as a time as, as I had. Um, so... Just leave me to thank again everyone for, for participating. It's been really amazing. Thanks so much to all of you for being here, for having given us this, this window into the world of sociology and physics. Thanks a lot. Uh, have a good evening. That was great fun. That was really great fun.